as in the words of great literary scholar and theologian C.S. Lewis, literature adds to reality. It does not simply describe it. It enriches the necessary competencies that daily life requires and provides. And in this respect, it irrigates the deserts of our lives. Warmest greetings to one and all, esteemed guests, that's all faculties and heads, and all the students present here at Lauren Hall this afternoon. It is with great enthusiasm that I welcome you all to today's book reading and review session, a talk with debuting authors, an initiative of the Department of English in collaboration with the Department of Linguistics. To commence with the session, let me read out the order of the program. Chairperson, myself, Vivili IA, BA English, fifth semester. Moderator, Tsukumla, Assistant Professor, Linguistics. Welcome note, Senjumbeni K. Jami, Assistant Professor, English. A special song by Sutilu, followed by the book review and the panel of discussion and a vote of thanks by Casavino. To commence with the session, I now invite Ms. Senjum Beni, Assistant Professor, Department of English, for the introduction of our special guests. Good afternoon, everyone. It is with profound joy and pleasure that I stand here today to warmly welcome each one of you to this book reading and review session. I want to extend my earnest gratitude to our esteemed authors for gracing us with your presence despite your other engagements. We are truly honored to have you in our midst today and we look forward to a time of learning and fruitful engagement. With that being said, allow me to introduce our esteemed authors. First, we have Mr. Twinto. Twinto Visuo holds a master's degree in English literature and has also recently completed his Bachelor of Divinity from Eastern Theological College, Jorhat. Presently, he is engaged with an institution to promote his unwavering love for literature amongst the youth. His debut book, Mea Kalpa, was re recently released on the 9th of September 2023, and the book is a collection of diaries from various remorseful characters living in different generations of the same lineage. Sir, we are extremely grateful uh, for, for your presence here today and I would like to take this time to just call you on the stage to receive a token of our appreciation. I would also like to request uh, Dr. Rosie, HOD English, to present the mementos to our uh, guests. Next, we have Sedengunyo Losa. Sedengunyo is a Tetsu, Tetsu alumni, MA English, class of 2022. Poetry Like Pineapple is her debut book, which was recently released on the 25th uh, August 2023. The poetry collection speaks in volumes about her life experiences as a teenager transi transitioning to maturity. Uh, I would like to request uh, Sedengunyo to come, uh, kindly come over to the stage to receive our token of love. Tetsu College warmly welcomes you back home. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, we have uh, Tara Lee Rebecca as a Zoom. She is one of our own, a familiar face, striving and thriving in excellence, and we couldn't be more prouder to have her as one of our esteemed guests today. Tara Lee is currently a BA Linguistics uh, third semester student of Tetsu College. Her debut book, Afterwards, was launched on the 25th of July, 2023. The book is a collection of the remnants of the fleeting moments of ordinary life. It is the epilogue of the things she went through to remind herself that people grow despite everything. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much, Sutilu, for livening our spirits with such a powerhouse performance. I would now like to invite the reviewers to present their insightful perspectives on the books as we look forward to revealing in the beauty and power of literature. You may take your time one after the other. A very good afternoon to everyone. But greetings to the esteemed guests of today, respected teachers, my seniors, and to all my fellow classmates present here today. 
My name is Kitia L. Lokumber from the Department of English for semester, and I am pleased to be given this chance, this platform, to share my thoughts on the book afterwards. Before I delve into my thoughts on the book, I wanted to extend my heartfelt congratulations on the publication of your first book, Terali. I think it is truly an admirable milestone and it is also very inspir inspiring to witness the talent that exists within our college community and your work is a shining example of that. The title itself, the title, uh, afterwards the title itself hints at the reflective nature of the poems. They act as remnants of the author's experiences offering a glimpse into the emotional journey of love and life. The themes of growth and the ability to move on are central, reminding readers of the resilience of the human spirit. In afterwards, the author presents a captivating collection of poems that serves as an introspective epilogue of the fleeting affairs of an ordinary life. Through these verses, the reader is invited into a world of love, regrets, growth, and vulnerability. The structure and the structure of the book is of an epilogue, and then there are short anecdotes and also a collection of, pro, uh, of poems, which has been divided into segments. This structure provides a unique and thoughtful viewpoint on the journey of life and the combination of prose and poetry offers a deep and meaningful insight into the author's thoughts and emotions at different stages of her life. The anecdotes in the book encompasses a range of themes including self-acceptance, family relationships, and the art of loving, judgment, and human vulnerability. It is also very interesting that the author, despite uh, writing formally in the anecdotes, chose not to alter the usage of contemporary Gen Z terms. I think this approach also added authenticity to the writing, making it more relatable to a younger audience who are familiar with these terms. This blending of formal writing and contemporary knowledge created a unique and a very engaging reading experience for me. And the entire poetry segment uh, explores the themes of love, relationships, acceptance, identity, and the complexities of human emotions. It emphasizes the value of self-expression, self-empowerment, and embracing imperfections. Throughout and throughout the poems, there's a beauty on the there's a focus on the beauty found in vulnerability and the authenticity, encouraging self-discovery, -disco uh, personal growth, and the recognition that life op offers opportunities for renewal and new beginnings, even after endings. And there's a closing quote in the book that deeply touched me, and it says. The moon may never write to you, but you will fall in love again. I think this God is a reflective way to conclude the book afterwards. You know, it expresses a sense of hope as it says, you will, uh, you will fall in love again. Suggesting that despite the uncertainties and challenges of life, love will always find a way back into our hearts. Afterwards, I think it's a reminder that despite life's challenges, we continue to evolve and carry forward. And even after the story ends, there is always a potential for new beginnings. I would recommend afterwards to anyone seeking poetry that delves into the depths of human emotions and the enduring strength found within. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, lecturer, and everyone present here. My name is Tokum Choi. I'm from uh, from the Department of English, Master's first semester. Uh, first of all, before I begin with my book review, I would, if anyone has read the book, I'm sure you'd be surprised that I, as a male human being, is standing before you to give the book review. And I do understand. But however, I am very privileged and honored to be uh, given this opportunity. To start with, the title of the book is, or the name of the book is Poet, uh, Poetry Like Pineapple. And before I started reading the book, I wondered why it could be so. And when I went through the contents, uh, it, it contains 23 poems, beautifully written, very beautifully written, of course. Uh, and I thought maybe it's because pineapples have segments, 
and maybe that's why it was named Poetry Like Pineapple. But after reading through the poems, after the three uh, divisions, all the, after getting through the 23 poems, I understood why it's called Poetry Like Pineapple. And I hope that by the end of this book review, we will also get a little bit insight on why it's named like that, according to me. So the poem, it talks about, of course, uh, our author, she said that this is not a socially or moral book. However, if you look into it, it talks a lot about uh, the challenges that a female might face in society. And I do not come here to say that I understood everything in the poem as a male. I do not. But however, there, there were some instances where it related uh, very deeply with me. Uh, for instance, in the first part of the poem, there is a poem called Tribute. And it resonated very well with me because uh, even me, uh, in my family, uh, I was raised by a single mother. And the power of a mother, I'm sure everyone knows uh, how important it is. And going through the poem, just going through the first poem was very phenomenal for me because it was re resonating very well. And my only issue with this is that there were not enough poems for me to uh, go through because by the end of the poem, I was thinking that it was a little short for me and I wanted to read more and more of this beautiful writing. Throughout the poem, as we go on, we learn about we learn about uh, the social injustices, uh, primarily with gender. It talks about uh, the duality in gender, the uh, the invisible patriarchy that we are in right now. Of course, it does not talk about it very openly, but then as you read in between the lines, and I'm, uh, I believe that poetry and its rhetorics are supposed to be subjective. And in my subjective opinion, I believe that it talks about such things. It also talks about uh, young love, betrayal, longingness, uh, and in overall the frailty of human beings, and also how we can hurt people without us realizing. In most instances, when we read through, when I was going through the poems, uh, in most of the poems, it was uh, the poem was talking about how somebody was hurt or somebody was betrayed. But then, as I went through the poems, it also made me realize that instead of thinking about myself and getting hurt, uh, in, that I'm getting hurt by somebody or somebody has done something bad to me, this poem very insightfully made me aware that maybe I'm also hurting someone. My actions are also uh, affecting someone somewhere that I do not realize, and that. In a very ironic twist, it made me realize in self-realization, it made me realize that I'm not the only person in the world. And I believe that we all think that there are people around, but sometimes we feel like we are the center of the universe. But this book was a very uh, phenomenal and eye-opening uh, experience for me. And for most of the time, I do enjoy reading books, and I would not consider myself a connoisseur of poems. But then I think after this, I'm getting a little bit into poetry. and. It's a very big honor, and I'm actually very nervous about meeting an actual author and reading it, giving the book review. And this is my first ever book review in ever, so I do hope you can apologize me. If I, I'm sorry, I apologize. You can forgive me if I do not follow the etiquettes that are necessary for this. The one thing subjectively that I took away from this book is that, like I said earlier, the frailty of human being. We do not know how fragile we are, and yet, in that frailty, we find, we find our strength. This book is written in such a way that by the end, when you start, uh, from the start to the end, I, I, I do not know if there is a certain order to which the poem has been particularly written, but in my subjective opinion, as I finished the book, I realized that we, in life we go through stages. We go through stages of dependency in the first uh, part of the poem, uh, of the book, or independency, dependent on our parents, uh, on our elders, or dependent on someone. Then we grow into our rebellious ten teenager age, where I'm sure a lot of us has faced heartbreaks. And it's funny because now at this age, when we look at our juniors or somebody young getting a heartbreak, we think it's very silly. But even for us, when we were in that heartbreak, it felt like the whole world was caving in. This shows how uh, we are very narrow-minded and then there was, uh, this is something that a principal of mine from high school said. He said that no matter how, how minute something may seem to you, to somebody else, it could mean the whole entire universe to them. So this is also another reminder of that. As you go through the point, by the second uh, candle, you learn that we think our problems are our whole world. 
But then if we keep pressing through, we'll find strength. And this, this book also has a touch of melancholy, uh, which we are just going through in the classroom, something called catharsis, you know, uh, using pity and fear uh, to invoke pleasure and entertainment, the purification of our emotions through pity and fear. And I believe this book does it very well in the most uh, nonchalant way, is what I would say. So that is my personal opinion and my review on the book. I hope it's as I would like to say for poetry, I think a review, okay, it helps, but then for poetry and such subjective topics, I believe it is better for all of us to go through the book by ourselves because I can experience something in a certain way, you can experience something in your certain way, and what are also experiences, and experiences are what makes us human beings. So I thank you everyone for indulging me in such, thank you very much. A very good afternoon to you all. Um, first of all, I would like to express my heartiest congratulations to the three debuting authors present here with us today. Um, my name is Dorila Janger, BA, third semester, Department of Linguistics, and the book I will be reviewing today is called Mea Culpa by Twinto Visuho. The title of the book, Mea Culpa, is a Latin phrase which means through my fault. It is an expression of apology that comes from a Catholic prayer of confession. The book Mea Culpa, written by Twinto Visuho, is a collection of narrations or diaries from the point of view of different characters in different generations but who belong to the same lineage or family. These characters share their experiences of remorseful events and tragedies in their lives, their moments of mea culpa. The book begins with the narration of the two characters, Fastina Lai and her husband, Lolo Lai, and ends with the final narration of the character, Linio, who eventually goes on to become the wife of Fastina and Lolo's grandson, Io, Bond. So the story progresses through three different generations. Uh, there are narrations by a, of stories by a total of seven characters in the book, written from their perspectives. So the book is a compilation of stories told from different characters' point of view, and in each story, we see how the characters navigate through the highs and lows in their lives, leading to a dramatic downfall, a moment of mea culpa, of regret, sorrow, or guilt. But this tragic downfall is then followed by a new beginning, uh, almost like the rise of a phoenix from its ashes, so to speak. Though the book is a combination of different stories of different characters, it forms one single story as a whole, told by many narrators. It is ultimately about the realization and acceptance of one's mistakes, hence the title Mea Culpa, which is an expression of apology. Um, we find traces of supernatural elements in the book, such as out-of-body experiences, visions, spirits, and so on. And such kind of writing piques the interest of the readers and also explores human emotions, fears, and desires in a heightened context, further driving the plot forward and keeping the readers engaged. Another important theme we find in the book is a family. I, for one, greatly appreciate the fact that the writer has demonstrated the love of a family, not only focusing on the typical mom-dad-child relationship, but also exploring the love of an imprisoned father, an orphaned child, uh, a grandmother, a single mother, and even twin siblings. The use of these dynamics is significant because it allows readers of all sorts to relate it to their own lives and families, including myself, because I've also been raised by a single mother, so I could relate to the story on so many levels. This relatability further enhances the overall impact of the story, making it more engaging and also emotionally resonant. We also find elements of Christian faith and belief in God throughout the narrations of the stories. Without giving away too much about the book, um, there is an instance where one of the characters finds God through a very disturbing and difficult time in his life. Uh, and he goes on to find the strength to not only forgive the person responsible for his pain and suffering, but also accepts his miserable situation because he had found his peace and contentment in God. This theme is evident throughout the book, with each character holding on to such a kind of faith and hope, and not only forgiving those who had wronged them, but also forgiving themselves for their own mistakes eventually. This makes up the defining moment of mea culpa in each of their lives, 
and from here on, there is a sense of a new beginning, a fresh start or a renewal of their minds and lives through all the experiences and lessons learned. The writer's style of writing is both simple and profound, captivating readers from all backgrounds of life. His employment of the first-person narration uh, style through each character's point of view creates an intimate connection between the readers and the characters. The book portrays the life's challenges and everyday struggles of ordinary middle-class individuals and families, which allows us to dive deeper into the thought process and emotional states of these characters and relate with them on all conventional levels. All in all, uh, Mia Kalpa is a book that tells a beautiful story uh, and has the potential to tuck at the strings of people's hearts by teaching us about life, love, forgiveness, and gratitude in only around 76 pages. I would say it is a must read and the kind of book that I could recommend to anyone and everyone. Thank you. I extend my gratitude to all the reviewers for meticulously crafting your reviews and offering us a piece of your perspective on the books. Your reviews have certainly given us a glimpse of what the book has in store for us and we look forward to discovering its essence. May I now invite on stage Ms. Tsukumla, Assistant Professor, Department of Linguistics, to lead us into the most awaited segment of today's event, the panel discussion. So okay, right away, we will, first of all, congratulations. And then, um, since Tirali is our student, and then to make it more comfortable for the others as well, I will start with Tirali. So in your uh, book, Collection of Fleeting Moments, you have so satisfactorily expressed the bitterness, uh, which we all feel deep inside. So how, can you tell us a little bit on how you express or how you have brought out those bitterness for all of us? Thank you for the question. I think um, it's all about going through it. You have to go through something in order to write it. So it's not about mentioning certain things or someone in order to write it. So I think it's all about my feelings, my personal feelings and how I perceive things and how I went through stuff. I hope that answers your question. Okay, now I would like to ask Duin Dong. You are also a theologian and a writer. So, was there any difficulty or can you mention the difficulty of creating a theological based story without sounding it like a sermon or without making it preachy? Thank you. I am asked a question, but before I give an address to that, let me take this time to thank you everyone for giving me this wonderful opportunity. And I may not know each and every one of you personally, but I would like to thank the authority as well for opening up the platform for me. Thank you very much. It means a lot to me. To the question asked, I would say that I would define myself as a person who is subscribed to literature and also a person who practices theology. When we hear the word theology, most of us, we think that when a person goes for theology, the tribal concept is that they want to be a pastor or something, someone who is engaged in the church or ministries. But for me, I, would, I take this platform in a way, not exactly a preaching platform, or sharing the gospel, but I have an interest in blending the concept of theology and literature. So where in a place where I can say something, I can share something about the concept of being a good human, I won't use the word gospel or uh, trying to bring, convert someone through my writings. But through my writings, I would love to see if there is any influence to a person to become a better person and contribute to a better world. Thank you. Okay, now I would like to go to Sedimono. So you have divided your poetry in three parts. Yeah, so was there a pattern in those three parts? Was there a connection between those three parts or 
are they three independent, independently different parts that speaks their own story? Thank you for the question. Uh, so the three parts they were not really parted uh, in a way that it'll uh, you know uh, say something else about the different parts. Uh, it was picked randomly mostly. Uh, I tried to put the first part uh, in a way that um, there will be something that I am relating personality to. Uh, so the second part and the third part, I think uh, they are the ones where I best my uh, other characters more there. Yeah. So there is not uh, there is not been a time that I chose them separately to make it into parts. It was just picked randomly mostly. So clearly in one of your chapters you have mentioned green as a love color. So can you tell us on like how like how it occurred to you with the choice of the green color and what describe it as your love color? Um, I think it has to do mainly with how I grew up. And it's not just me. I think we grew up thinking that we have our parents have the most perfect love story and they always love us, they will always care for us. We think very positively of love, but as I grew up, I realized that love can be of course positive, but it's it can also contain some heavy elements. Like, love is not always spring-like. It's something, sometimes it's disturbing, and it's like an addiction, but it's beyond human to avoid being loved or to love something. So as I grew up, my understanding of love became a little heavy and a little sad at the same time. So, and green was, green felt, the color green felt like that. The color green is something you like, but it can never be anyone's favorite. Well, maybe one or two, but you can't just say green is such a bright color. You can, you cannot say green is a dull color either. And I think that Mm, that is why love feels very green to me. That's a very well defined from your point of view. So I'll get back to Duindo. Did you experience any Mia Galba moments in your life that made you create this work? How did this work come about? In this work, I should confess that it's a work written about four years ago, but I had to engage myself in, a, in, in an institution of theology where I had to have my preparation with that area. And after, my, after the completion of my Bachelor's of Divinity, I got the privilege to launch this book and so uh, here I am. And Regarding about the inspiration of writing the book, actually this book I have uh, mentioned a dedication to my late twin brother, who I had a twin brother, who is no more in this world, but I hope this, would, this message would reach out to him in heaven, and this is a dedication to him, and regarding about the moment of miracle in my life, I some sometimes i feel like there is also a fragment of my fault in the happening of this tragic life so i did not participate myself in any of the characters of the plot but i may try to design it in a fictional way where i can put out my feelings about how it would be if I am to put into real life. So uh, that I should say is an inspiration to me. When I read the book Mia Kalba, it uh, struck to me the phrase "forgive to be forgiven." So I mean, your inspiration, your twin brother, your late twin brother, as your inspiration is a very beautiful. Um, it gave birth to a very beautiful book for all the readers. So, okay, now uh, getting back to Sedevono. In one of your, in the introduction of your book, you have mentioned 
My writings not be judged in the view of the family background I was raised from. It intrigued me because this line has so much to say in so many ways, like in the form of uh, morality sometimes, or status, or in so many ways. So please tell us your thoughts on becoming a writer or a poet at the risk of judging readers, especially from your friends and family. Uh, so I wrote that because uh, I am actually raised from, uh, obviously like everyone else, I am raised from a Christian background, but uh, I am a pastor's daughter. So uh, it's very contrasting because um, when you say that you're a pastor's daughter or a pastor's son, uh, people tend to judge you and they want you, it's like you're living in a glass house. So they judge you and they look at every actions that you're doing. So uh, when I started writing, I like the I like to uh, write very openly. Uh, I would say it's uh, I write vulnerably, and I wanted to be so open with my feelings and my characters. I wanted to express human emotions, and when I did that, uh, I felt like people would judge me, not just me, but my uh, parents and the background I was raised from. So uh, I was very scared about that at first and that is why this collection has been in the closet for such a long time. But uh, I finally gained courage after uh, talking to not just my parents but my uh, near and dear ones. So I talked to them about the collection. I told them how it is and how uh, my writings actually are. So I told them about it and they were really open about it. They accepted how I wrote it and then uh, uh, they very surprisingly they were so encouraging and then they told me to go for it so uh, that's why I wrote it and um, if you go through my book there will be some illustrations also so uh, there were some questions at first from some uh, family members also so uh, if you go through the book you'll see it but um, they, some of them they questioned me about the illustrations also so um, those are actually pictures from the internet, but I told them that I wanted to uh, not just convey the message through words, but I also wanted to see them, uh, to let them see the poem through the illustrations also, so that they will be able to have uh, a better connection with the poem. Yeah, so that's it. Okay, so um, in a restricted world, like where we are living, we live in a society where we are restricted to certain morals, but I feel um, in a world of fiction, we do not have any rules, so I would encourage everyone to the, to the writers in the participants also to put forward your feelings in the fictional world. There is no um, rules to it. So thank you to Sete for opening the way for us. So back to Tirali again. In, um, Many of your points you have mentioned it, but particularly the marriage and Mary. Okay, uh, it strikes me in one way. You have mentioned clearly about um, two women falling in love. So, as an author, okay, not as a student, not as a student, as an author, would you would you highlight on the LGBTQ community in relevance to our society? And how should the present generation react to it while growing up in a confused world? Um, to be like brutally honest, I don't have any opinions regarding that community. Uh, and the bones, the two bones mentioned specific, specifically, are came out from my idea of falling in love with a girl. I've never fallen in love with a girl, but. I, I feel like the idea of falling in love with a girl is something so feminine and something I want to embrace so much. But so and regarding LGBTQ and our generation, um, I really don't have any opinion. <laughs> it's okay, no problem. But I would like to involve Twin Doll. He's a theologian. So how do we? Um, how should we empathize the community? And um, from your point of view, from theological point of view, how should we empathize with the LGBTQ community? For me, I am not a professional one, but 
if I comment on this, it would be a controversy. For instance, it's an open discussion, so yes. I think all the opinions are accepted. There is no problem. Okay. If I say that it is something which we can encourage, there are some group of people who would target me again. And if I say that it, it should be discouraged, because because there are different group of people and with different mindsets. But I think I should say as a Christian, as a person adhering to our own faith, we should listen to our heart and we should, if we think that it is guilty of us to, prefer, to practice, I think it should not be encouraged. And if we think it is not guilty and if we think that does not disturb our faith, I think we should not discourage as well because everyone we know is a creation of God and everyone deserves a second chance. So we should not deal with some group of people in a harsh way thinking that we are right. I think that is what I can comment as of now. It's all about kindness, right? It's all about kindness towards each other, right? Because I feel, personally, I feel that it's not their fault also. Sometimes uh, the peer pressure can influence, right? But then I feel it's not their fault as well. But then like being kind can be one thing that we can do to them. Okay, coming back to Twinto again. What are your challenges as a theologian in the world of literature? Your challenges as a theologian in the world of literature? I should say it is not an easy road because when I pursue for theology, the expectation of the people, it is raised towards me serving in the church or somewhere engaging myself in ministry. But I used to imagine myself, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of young readers who loves reading, who are engaged in the world of literature, but they are far away from the church but they have failed to maintain their faith and relationship with God. So I think, I told myself that I should engage myself into the world of literature and in a way see if I can influence the young readers, not to convert them, but see if I can get a chance to speak to their heart about their faith as well, about the things that they should do in life and not just simply go along with the flow of today's youth generation. There were multiple challenges I faced, but, but there is one I would like to highlight, which is heading your own writing. Personally, I don't like what I write. It's not that I hate it, but I feel like if afterwards was written by someone else, I would have liked it more. And as for the advice, I think it would be to be emotionally ready because it, it takes a lot of time, like uh, Miss Sadie has mentioned earlier, and to not give up. No matter how many negative, negative thoughts you have, don't give up. If I am to say on this question, I would say, if we could, you can as well. As much, much of the things, much of the elements have been shared my, by my two uh, authors. And, but I would say, if we can, you can as well. As you experience, you will engage yourself into many challenges. But that's a part of life. Go for it, I would say. Okay, I'll stop here with it. Okay, we'll stop here with the Q&A. Since we also have a book signing, book signing in the reception, we will not waste more time. But I would like to sum, I would like to sum up uh, the books according to my perspective. For Tirati, it was nostalgic, and I also grew studied in a Catholic institute. I grew up with like in an all girls in all girls school, and the the chaos, the emotional roller coaster, the confusion. Everything was so relevant to me because, not to me, but as through my friends and then through my 
other like siblings young, who were younger than me. So I felt uh, so much connection with your story. And then um, what I'd like to say is your, your book stopped in a teenage year. And then what I'd like to add is um, what stays, what is meant to stay stays and what is meant to go. Okay, what is meant to go on, it goes on. So that sums up everything. And then for Duinto, like I said, it was a prayer story. And in the character of Io, I saw uh, redemption, where redemption basically is uh, creating something new out of the broken things. So in Io's character, I saw a redemption. And then, like I said, it was a message of forgive to for forgive to be forgiven. And then, forgive to be for uh, forgiven on both the ends, so that the living or the dead, okay, on both the ends can be at peace. And then we have Sedunguna's Poetry Like Pineapple. Uh, for me, there was a connection in those three parts where the first part of the story, like um, how Toku also have commented on it. it uh, the first part of the story talks about how a young girl was under the care of an elders, okay, parents, under the care of um, the elders. And then in the second part of the story where she grows up and sees the reality of the world, okay? And then there was also the chaos, okay? The emotional roller coaster. And then in the third phase, the satisfaction, the catharsis, like we said, uh, she found self-love, okay? And in the book, in the last part of the book, she found self-love. So that was most satisfying to me because um, the author did not let the validation or the opinion of others validate the emotion of that particular character. So it was such a beautiful read. I totally enjoyed reading all of your books. Congratulations once again. Congratulations to the reviewers as well. And um, yeah, would like to bring an end to the panel discussion here.